Buenas tardes, bienvenidos a la serie de seminarios Los Ecólogos de Krebs, la regulación de poblaciones. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Este día es el, la octava charla que vamos a tener. Y les comento que está, tenemos una página web donde ya están las presentaciones en inglés y en español. Si entran a la página web que van a ver en el Facebook, pueden descargar las presentaciones y más adelante tendremos las traducciones completas. Eh, es un, por favor, si nos están escuchando, escriban su nombre en Facebook, díganos desde dónde nos están viendo y al final de la charla pues tendremos tiempos para preguntas. Eh, rápidamente en español les voy a presentar a nuestro eh, conferencista de hoy, él es Anthony Sinclair, es profesor emérito de zoología de la Universidad de Columbia Británica en Canadá y él pasó su juventud en Tanzania. Estudió en Oxford eh, bajo el, la supervisión del premio Nobel Nico Timbergen, que es considerado el padre de la ecología de comportamiento y de Hugh Lamprey en el Instituto de Investigaciones del Serengeti. Su doctorado fue sobre la ecología del búfalo africano del este. Desde entonces, eh, el doctor Sinclair ha llevado a cabo investigaciones de ecología en África, en Australia, en Nueva Zelanda y en Canadá. Sí. Ok. Ok, gracias. El doctor Sinclair ha escrito varios libros, de hecho tiene una serie de por lo menos cuatro libros sobre el Serengeti, la dinámica del Serengeti, el manejo y la conservación, los impactos humanos del Serengeti y también cómo mantener la diversidad biológica en este gran ecosistema. Él este, también escribió un libro junto a un gran, otro, otro gran ecólogo, que es Graham Cockley, sobre la ecología de la fauna silvestre y su manejo. Es un gran libro. El doctor Sinclair es miembro de la Sociedad Real de Londres y también de la Sociedad Real de Canadá. Yo tuve la oportunidad de conocerlo en Canadá porque también es parte de los proyectos del de Bosque Boreal en el Parque Nacional Cluani y conocí a varios de los estudiantes que forman parte de esta historia. Él fue asesor también del doctor Stan Butin, del cual ya han ustedes escuchado un par de charlas, pero no estando satisfecho con su trabajo en tantos continentes, recientemente el doctor Sinclair ha explorado el cine. Así es que ahora es parte de de una película que se llama Las reglas del Serengeti, que ha ganado un, un premio Emmy y donde se describe la pasión de, de seis ecólogos y, y eh, biólogos evolutivos. Está en internet, lo pueden buscar. Es un gran placer presentar al doctor Sinclair, que nos hablará de 50 años de investigación en las planicias del Serengeti. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Please leave your name on the Facebook side. We will have questions at the end too. This is the eighth seminar that we have on the series Krebs Ecologists um, on population regulation. Today we have Dr. Anthony Sinclair. He is Professor Emeritus of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. He did his, uh, well, he spent his childhood in Tanzania. Then he studied at Oxford under Nobel Prize Nico Timbergen, father of behavioral ecology, and worked under Hugh Lamprey at the Serengeti Research Institute. His PhD thesis was on the ecology of the East African buffalo. Since then, he has conducted ecological research in Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. He has written several books You can find a series, a uh, list of four books on the Serengeti, which deal with the dynamics of the ecosystem, the management and conservation, human impacts, and sustaining biodiversity. He also wrote a book, which I really like, 
with the, another great ecologist, Graham Cogley, whose title is Wildlife Ecology and Management. Dr. Sinclair is a fellow of the Royal Society of London and the Royal Society of Canada. I met him in, in Canada many moons ago. I met several of his students that participate in the story that he's going to tell us today. And he also was working in the Kluani project that you heard is in several talks. He was uh, the advisor of Dr. Stan Booting, of whom you already heard a couple of seminars. Not satisfied with working on several continents, recently, a couple of years ago, Dr. Sinclair has explored the biggest screen. He's part of a great film called The Serengeti Rules, a film that has won an Emmy Award and which I would recommend to you to look for it in internet. And uh, the film narrates the passion of six ecologists and evolutionary biologists that were actually uh, beginners uh, in this field of animal ecology. It is with great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Sinclair, who will talk to us about his last 50 years of research in the amazing Serengeti Plains. Thank you very much, Dr. Sinclair, and the screen is yours. Thank you, Carlos. It's wonderful to see an old friend again after so many years. And it's also wonderful to talk to all of you. Um, I wish I could see you, but that's the situation for the times of these days. Today, I'm going to tell you a story, a detective story. This is a uh, Serengeti is a very special site place and it has been ranked the number one world heritage site, the, the number one most important site for conservation in the world. So the question is, why is it like this? Why have people decided that this is so special? I was interested when I started in the 1960s to find out why it was the way it was, what makes it the way it is and what keeps it going because we know it's been around for many millions of years. In other words, what are the rules that regulate the system? But first, let's just see where the Serengeti is. This map of Africa shows that the Serengeti here is really just about on the equator in East Africa. It is actually largely in Tanzania, but a little bit of it spills over into Kenya. Right, okay. Uh, it has, it is uh, situated near Lake Victoria. Uh, this is the edge of Lake Victoria here. And then over in the east are uh, mountains, uh, the volcanic mountains. There are two major habitats, one we call savanna, and the other one here, uh, the, uh, the plains. Savannas are basically scattered trees with grasslands, some dense trees, some much more open. Largely acacias, but many other species too. The plains, as you see here, are treeless, and they were formed some four million years ago by the ash from these volcanoes being blown over and settling. This, uh, that's the, the one remaining volcano that's still active now. <clears throat> now the main species in this story is the wildebeest. It's the size of a small cow and lives in large numbers. They move out onto those short grass plains when the rain falls when it's wet and stay there through the period of from January through perhaps to June. However, there's no water on the plains. And so when the rains stop, they have to leave and they get into dense herds and move westwards. And the reason is that they're looking for water because water is more important than anything. So that's basically what the wildebeest are doing. We call that the map here shows the rainfall gradient. That there's a very steep gradient with the plains down in the southeast having only 400 millimeters of rain a year, whereas up in the north here on the border with Kenya, it's as much as 1,200 millimeters. <clears throat> 
And essentially what the wildebeest are doing is when they're here on the plains and it dries out, they're just basically moving northwest up into the wetter areas where they can get more water and more food. So that's the basic pattern that we have there. Also migrating uh, uh, with the wildebeest are zebra and Thompson's gazelle. These uh, gazelles are much smaller, zebra are just a bit bigger than the wildebeest. <clears throat> but there's much more than that. There's 29 species of ungulates in all, the largest diversity uh, anywhere in the world of ungulates. I'm just showing a few here um, and, and ask you to, to remember what they look like. These are small ones. There's a whole range in size. Oraby here, uh, 10 to 20 kilos. Medium sized ones, the size of a white tailed deer, for example, uh, impala, and twice the size of a deer, the topi. I'll be talking about these later. And then we get the much larger animals such as buffalo and giraffe. Then in addition to that, we have a very large number of predator species, uh, some 28 species of small to large. Here's a couple of small ones, the golden wolf and the black-backed jackal. Uh, then medium-sized ones, the spotted hyena and leopard. And then we have the large-sized lions. So a large diversity of predators that go along with the herbivores. Now, when I started, it was discovered that wildebeest populations and buffalo populations were increasing and nobody understood why. Uh, we knew nothing about any of these species. Uh, science uh, really only got into East Africa in the 1950s and we basically knew nothing about anything. So we had to start from scratch. And the first question was, why are these species increasing? As we see here in the graph. And to answer that question, we have to go back 130 years to the end of the last uh, of the of the 19th century. And an event which was called the Great Rinderpest Epidemic. Rinderpest is a virus. It's similar to measles, and it's a virus of cattle. It had never been in Africa before, as far as we know, and it was introduced in 1889 uh, into Ethiopia. And within five years, it spread right across Africa uh, down to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. In that time, it killed 95% of the cattle of Africa and related wild species, buffalo, wildebeest, and a few others. Because human populations depended on these cattle, we know that half the population of places like Ethiopia and Tanzania died from starvation as a consequence of that. So this pandemic, which of course is, um, is very similar uh, in effect to the Black Death in Europe in the 1300s, the smallpox in America in the, in the 1500s, and of course COVID now. And that event of removing all of these species 130 years ago, basically has affected everything else that we have seen taking place in the Serengeti ever since. And that's part of the detective story. And this picture here is just showing that we actually have evidence of people around the Serengeti starving at that time, a photograph taken in 1890. Rinderpest then stayed in Africa throughout uh, the 20th century until 19 the early 1960s. Most of the adult wildebeest and buffalo had become immune. They got antibodies, um, but, the only, but the young wildebeest and buffalo uh, did not have those and they were the ones that died. Then in the early 1960s, uh, veterinarians decided to vaccinate the cattle against rinderpest and put a ring of vaccinated cattle around Serengeti and a result was that the rinderpest died out of the wildlife. This was not something they expected to happen, but it was very clear when it did happen. And we know this because we collected blood samples from the animals um, to get their antibodies. Picture of my wife here collecting blood from a buffalo at that time in the 1960s. And from the samples of uh, blood, and the animals that we collected them from, we could 
we knew what age that each of these animals was born and we looked at what proportion um, of the animals had antibodies and what you see here for buffalo is that all of them had antibodies in the 1950s wildebeest similarly but very rapidly in the 1960s the number of uh, animals, the proportion of animals that had antibodies dropped to zero. No animals born after 1963 or 64 had, the, had antibodies, which meant that the disease had died out. So essentially the answer to the question, what caused that increase, was that it was the removal of rinderpest through that vaccination, uh, and this allowed the increase in wildebeest and buffalo, as, as you see here. This is, of course, what we guessed was happening prior to that, that the wildebeest were knocked down, and then there was a slow increase, and then went, once it was removed, there was a very rapid increase. So that leads then to the next question. If they were increasing, what's going to stop the increase uh, and therefore regulate the population? Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what regulation is because Professor Krebs has talked about that in his first talk. But just think of it in this sense that it's like a thermostat in a house. That when things are too high, the thermostat brings it down. When they're too low, the thermostat brings it back up again. Only we're not talking about temperature here in these populations. We're talking about survival. Survival goes down when, uh, when populations are too high. Su survival improves when populations are too low. So that's essentially the essence of what we're talking about here. In order to look for that, we had, of course, know something about the dead animals, which we counted on the ground, and the young animals, which we were able to count either on the ground or from photographs. And you can see here, uh, young, these are buffalo, and this has a young one about six months old. You probably can't see, but in this little black dot here is a newborn buffalo. And we can tell from the horns whether these are females or males. This is a male, this is a female. Uh, so we can get a general um, breakdown of what the population looked like. As a consequence of that and taking, um, I say it in a few seconds, but this in fact took us uh, a better part of 30 years to get this information. What we found was that the adult mortality, the deaths of adult animals, increased as the wildebeest population increased. So this is the evidence for what's called a density dependent mechanism, Mort mortality of adults increased and that resulted in regulating. So death rate was the regulating mechanism. Birth rate did not change, it stayed the same. Oh, I should just say here, uh, a lot of this work was done by my student, Dr. Simon and Duma, who uh, has been with me for 30 years or so, and he now runs my program in Serengeti, taken over the program. As a consequence of that regulation, what we see is that the population increased and then they leveled out as would uh, be expected from a regulatory mechanism. So the population was regulated. That leads to the, the third question, which is if deaths were causing the regulation, then what caused the deaths? Now the two large, uh, the main possibilities are food or predators. Uh, there are, of course, several others, but we don't have time to go into everything here. Essentially, if you have numbers like this, this is the wildebeest population, they can eat up all their food. So it's quite likely that food uh, could be a problem for them. So food supply caused starvation, um, and that caused the deaths. We had, of course, to measure the food. But the problem was we knew nothing about these animals. We didn't even know what their food was. So we first had to find out what that was. And in order to do that, I had to capture some baby buffalo. Uh, we actually also did that for wildebeest, but I'll just talk about the buffalo. Um, I'll talk about the buffalo I I I at this point of time. So we had to go out and capture some buffalo. It was actually a dangerous exercise because we had to take them out of the out of the herds. Uh, these are dangerous animals, and the and the, the mothers, of course, did not like us doing this, and they chased us. Uh, but eventually, we got them home. These babies were extremely wild uh, and attacked us. But 
as soon as I was able to feed them milk from a bottle, just one feeding, they became completely tame. Uh, just once, that was all it took. And then I was mother and they followed me around everywhere in our compound here, our research compound here. And they followed it so closely that if we went inside our house uh, without closing the door, we'd soon find them inside the house with us. Um, also, we found that uh, when we went for walks in the evening, um, my wife and I could not walk together because the elder of the two buffalo looked on me as mother and in buffalo uh, society, uh, babies follow their mothers. So my wife, Anne, was horned out of the way and then the younger one had to follow the, the, the elder of the buffalo. And so we went for walks with me in the front and my wife at the back. And so long as uh, we obeyed the rules of the game, everybody was happy. I used these buffalo then I, to tell me what they like to eat. And here's an experiment where I was giving them different types of grass food. They're all grass eaters and they definitely had preferences. Some they liked, some they did not like. With that knowledge, we were able to then go back out and start measuring how much food there was. And here we are picking grass in plots here to measure the amount of food. On top of that, we had to go and measure, uh, go and look at uh, and assess what was happening to the animals. And we had to find out whether they were starving or not. And it turns out that the bone marrow is the best indicator of starvation. In this particular photograph, of course, I was getting the, uh, the bone marrow from the animal. Uh, I was sharing it with a jackal who was too hungry to wait for me to finish. This um, bone marrow uh, in a healthy animal is almost solid fat, white, but in a starving animal, it is completely gelatinous uh, and clear. And that's a, uh, such a clear indicator that it was very easy for us to score whether we had animals that were dying of starvation or not. And again, taking uh, over 20 years to get this information, what we found was uh, that the percent of, of the population that was starving increased as the population density increased. And by this, we mean the number of animals per unit of food. So the lack of food was the cause of regulation. So the answer to these questions is, buffalo and wildebeest ate up all their grass food uh, and died from starvation and disease. Only a few were killed by predators. Populations leveled out, regulated by food supply. Now, I should say at this point that weather causes fluctuations, droughts and floods in our case, temperature is not important. Um, uh, droughts will, of course, uh, lower the survivorship, and this usually takes place of young animals, the yearlings, the calves, and that will reduce the population. Floods will cause uh, greater amounts of food and there'll be greater survival, and there will be an increase in population. So these cause changes uh, disturbances from the equilibrium which is produced by regulation. However, regulation then brings it back again. So that's the analogy to the, um, the temperature scale in houses. Now we get to the fourth question. So far, I've only talked about wildebeest and buffalo. But what about all those other species, especially the little herbivores? To look at that, we had, of course, again, um, go and measure uh, the mortality, measure the deaths. But the problem with small animals is that they all get eaten up very quickly. Um, and the carcasses are not left lying around for us to look at. So we got around that by putting radios on these small animals like this which told us when the animals died. And we were then able to go out quickly and find them before they all disappeared. And before I go into that, we first have to understand a little bit about the, the carnivores and what they like to eat. Here we have a graph which shows the carnivores in, going from lions at the bottom, the big ones, to the very small ones at the top. And as you can see, there's quite a large number of species. And this bar graph here shows us the size of animals that each of these carnivores can eat. 
and lions can eat a very wide range, starting from, you know, one kilogram. They'll eat a hare if the hare's stupid enough to run past it. Uh, they normally like animals the size of wildebeest, but they eat uh, buffalo as well. Hyenas have a smaller range. And as you see, as we go to the smaller carnivores, they have smaller and smaller ranges. So instead of the normal partitioning of niches of, of species next to each other, what we have here is that the food niches of carnivores are included, of small carnivores, are included inside the niches of larger carnivores. And that has a very special effect, which is that small prey, small herbivores here, have a large number of species eating them, whereas large species have only very few species eating them, and very large species have none. Now we can ask the question, so what's killing these species, these herbivores? And if we, uh, from the evidence that we were getting from the radios, what we found was that the proportion of deaths that was due to predators was 100% in these little guys that, that I showed you earlier, Oribi, Impala, Topi. All of them died from predation. We had populations of non-migratory wildebeest and non-migratory zebra, stationary populations, and they were also high. But very rapidly, as we get larger, it drops. So the buffalo, giraffe have very little predation. These are rhino, hippo, and elephant. They have zero predation. So what we see then is a double pattern, high values and very low values, and a very rapid switch over. It isn't a gradual slide, it is a switch. Now the consequence of that therefore is that size determines what cause of regulation occurs. Large ungulates are food regulated, small ungulates are predator regulated, so we have a complex regulation of both things going on. Predation, which we call top-down regulation, and uh, food supply, which we call bottom-up regulation. And this diversity of both prey and predators actually results in a stability of the system. And what that means for conservation is that if we lose some of those predator species, or indeed if we lose some of the prey species, we get a much more unstable situation in the ecosystem. So if somebody asks the question, in conservation, do we need to save all of the species? These kind of results, this pattern that we get, says, yes, indeed, we do need all of those species. Next question, what causes the migration? What we find, of course, in the Serengeti is that, as I showed, some species migrate and their populations are very large. Others do not migrate and they have small populations. So why is this? Going back to the wildebeest, just to remind you, in the dry season where there's a lot of rain up in the northwest, the wildebeest are here. But when the rains start, the wildebeest move quite rapidly. They can sometimes run all the way 100 kilometers or more to the plains down here. And the reason for that is that the plains have the best food. They're very high nutrition food from the soils, the volcanic soils, and they, um, the wildebeest prefer this and that's where they give birth and they can survive very well. The problem for them is that the rains don't last. And once the place dries out, they have to leave. So the food supply is actually um, only temporary. But what we find is that there are some species who are adapted to, to long distance travel. Wildebeest have certain adaptations to do that. And they can also eat this kind of grass. Those adaptations allow them to take advantage of this temporary food, go there and then come back again. And their population, because of this extra food, their populations are large. Other species like buffalo, they can't eat this kind of food. It's too small, for, too short for them. So they can't move out there anyway. Other species can't move that far, so they can't move out either. So they have to have stationary uh, resident populations, we call them, and their populations are much smaller. And this 
is work done by one of my students, John Frixell, who's still working with me now. And so the conclusion, the answer to the question is, planes provide temporary food. And this temporary food allows high populations and therefore food regulation. At the same time, and I haven't mentioned until Till now, aren't my great. And that's because their babies uh, take a long time to grow. Here's a picture of the lioness having to carry her baby. Whereas a wildebeest baby can run as fast as its mother within 24 hours. Uh, these uh, lion cubs can't move um, on their own very far for six weeks. So m predators can't migrate, and therefore the migrants can escape predator regulation. Therefore, extra food and little predation allow populations to have huge, uh, allow migrants to have huge populations. And this, uh, this rule actually applies to all migrating species in the world, even the monarch butterflies. So the next question is, how do ecosystems respond to natural climate change? We know that everything is changing all of the time. We know from what I've just talked about that ecosystems are regulated. So how are these two things matched up? One is regulating, which is suggesting or uh, being stationary and yet uh, a stationary equilibrium, but at the same time, the environment is always changing over long periods of time. And for example, the ice ages. Species have to change, as the climate changes, species have to change their distributions. Climate gets warmer, populations go to cooler areas and vice versa. So species move, but the point is each species moves at a different, different rate. And because they move at different rates, it means that over time and as the climate is changing, the communities of species are changing. The mix of species changes too. So everything changes over long periods of time. Now we have evidence of this actually taking place from um, fossil information, from very old information going back millions of years uh, on the Serengeti Plains, and also much more recently over the last hundred years from photographs taken by hunters and photographers. Uh, and I'll talk about a pair called Martin and Oza Johnson. But first, here is a graph showing the um, vegetation that's on the plains uh, currently on the plains now, um, as it was four million years ago here. So this is four million there and present day over here. And judging, we can judge what the vegetation is basically by the carbon 13 signature, but never mind that, just look over here. Four million years ago, the plains now were once dense woodland. And gradually, in two sites, Lytoli and Olduvai, gradually, that changed from bushland to savanna until currently now grassland. So it never stayed the same, continually changed. And in the important point also is it's not going to stop now. We can't expect everything to just stay as it is. It's going to continue to change. So that's a very important understanding. Even in the last hundred years, we see changes taken by hunters and photographers. And this was in the 1920s. Here, Martin Oza Johnson, 1928. They liked hunting, but they also were one of the first filmers. And here's Martin sitting on the front of his Model T Ford uh, trying to photograph um, lions, which is what they preferred, uh, that, what, which is what they were doing uh, out there, making films of lions. Uh, that was in the 20s, in the early 30s, they actually took out an, an amphibious plane and they filmed from the plane. They got the idea that what they should do was to shoot a topi and tie it to the back of the plane and then drive past a lion pride who, lions being like cats, jumped on the topi that was being dragged on the ground and uh, jumped on it just like cats jump on a ball of paper. This worked very well and they took films from over here, but it wasn't actually a very good idea because not every time did they need to have a, a topi attached to the back. They actually had to fly the plane, take off and land again. 
And the lions now had become trained to seeing that whenever this plane showed up, there was a, a, a meal uh, to be had. So when they came back from um, a flight and landing, all these lions came running up to them to look for the topi, which wasn't there. And because they couldn't find it, they started looking around, which also included climbing up into the plane and trying to get into the front here. Um, and Oza had to hit them with a bag of flour to try and chase them off, uh, making both the, the lioness and, uh, and herself completely white in flour in the process. So after that, they stopped doing that. Never mind. What I was more interested in, here's the lion, 1928. I was more interested in the vegetation. And this is a savanna of a particular tree species called Comifera. 50 years later, I went back to the very same site here, and we see that it had changed to grassland. These Comifera trees are just odd little bits of broken down uh, remnants left here. Twenty or so years later, I went back again, and we have now a savanna again, but this time a different species. These are acacias. So both tree density and species community changed over the 75 years. So we have continual change uh, going on, back and forth. So the answer, ecosystems show slow change. Climate is always changing, and this alters the abundance of food and degree of predation. These are the two that determine the equilibrium levels of populations. And so this equilibrium level also has to be changing along with the climate. Ecosystems therefore have to check this changing equilibrium level. The result is a serious problem for conservation because our general uh, way of conducting conservation, our main technique for conservation is to set up uh, um, national parks and protected areas, but these are static. And since all these uh, populations and communities, species communities are changing all the time, they will be moving in and out of these static protected areas. In other words, they can't accommodate change that is taking place all of the time. Protected areas now are highly likely not to be protecting the same species in 100 years from now. So the final question is, can ecosystems show fast change as well as the slow change that I've been talking about? The, I, the reason I ask this is because we find that as slow changes continues, it, it can't continue forever. It reaches a threshold, it reaches a point where suddenly it flips into a different uh, state, uh, a state of new species communities. And I can illustrate this again in the Serengeti by changes in the savanna tree populations. Initially, we found that for something like 60 years, tree populations in the Serengeti from the 1920s, when we have our first uh, photographs, to 1980, the tree populations declined, and they declined because of grass fires. Uh, they're all caused by humans, but there's, that's nothing special. Uh, humans have been causing fires in Africa for at least half a million years, and maybe even a million years. So this is quite normal. But the fires killed baby trees, and therefore adult trees gradually died off, and the, the savanna was changing from um, woodland into grassland. And then all of a sudden the fires declined because wildebeest came along and ate up all the grass and the fires need grass to burn. With lack of fires, we got baby trees surviving and savannah returned. That was how it was on the Tanzania side of the Serengeti. But we had a problem because on the Kenya side, this didn't happen. Fires, here's grass fires taking place every year. They burned 80 to 90% of the system every year. 
And in 1980, thinking that we'll lose all of the trees, I set up a series of points on, on hills from where I could take photographs and record the disappearance of the trees, the complete change from savanna into grassland. And what I found was in fact exactly the opposite taking place. Here is the photograph taken in 1980. It's a photograph which shows adult trees here, mature trees, and effectively no regeneration, no baby trees in here, just grassland and big trees. In 1986, what we find is this little dark patch here is in fact baby trees growing up. 91, you see this is now spread, and by 2011, it has become a dense woodland. So we had a very rapid change over a period of 20, 30 years from uh, almost grassland, open savanna into dense woodland. And this is just a graph which shows it, it's the rate of change of the vegetation here. Uh, zero means that the vegetation, the tree populations are not changing. Below zero means that the populations are declining, tree populations. And then we see about 1970s when the wildebeest population started to increase again, we suddenly see a massive increase in the tree population. But, uh, so that was on the Tanzania side. In the Kenya side, that didn't happen. Here is a photograph taken in 1944 of uh, two little hills in the, in the Mara, in the, in the Kenya side of the Serengeti system. And it's a poor photograph, but these dark areas here, that's, those are trees, and that's quite a lot of trees there, it's uh, savanna. Forty years later, I went to the same spot and took this photograph and there's only two trees left, the rest is grassland. So that was the same as Serengeti. But instead of trees coming back, as in Serengeti, we find that 40 years later still, now, it's still grassland. No trees came back, not one. This one tree here is the same one as this over here. So the complete absence of trees was a completely different effect from what was happening in Serengeti, where everywhere in Serengeti, except on the plains, which are a different system, everywhere in the Serengeti, trees were coming back, doesn't matter what species they were. So what was happening? Why was that? Why that was, was due to uh, some work that was conducted by another one of my students, Holly Dublin, who uh, not only measured uh, baby trees, the survival of baby trees, but also watched elephants. And what she saw was something that nobody had ever seen before. Everybody had been looking at elephants pushing over big trees, and that's what they ate, big trees. So they didn't bother to look at what were they, do they were doing here in this grassland. And what they were doing was pulling up baby trees. These trees are only 15 to 20 centimeters high. And each one of them is doing this, this one, this one, this one, this one. It, are all pulling up baby trees. And they're so good at doing this that they can pull up every single one of them. None survive. And so we have therefore a situation where we have a system where on the Tanz here is the border between Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, they're both Serengeti. Uh, there's no actual boundary here, it's, um, it's just on a map. I've drawn it in as a red line here, and it's dead straight. And what we find here are trees on the Tanzania side, elephants um, are there too, and on the Kenya side, we have no trees and we have elephants. So we have two, two states, elephants minus trees and the elephants plus trees. Now this raises the question that I'm sure you're all asking is, well, what happened? If, if elephants could keep trees out in Kenya, why not Tanzania? And the answer was that a natural experiment took place. Poachers removed elephants during the 1980s and we basically lost all of them. And because there were no elephants there, the baby trees were able to survive and grow up. But those poachers did not work in Kenya uh, the elephants remained here in Kenya, 
and they were the ones who were able to remove the trees. So we have these two states, elephants and no trees, and elephants with trees. Here is bottom-up regulation, here is top-down regulation. So we can get two different states under the same conditions. Okay, so as a summary of what we found from the Serengeti work, we can say the following things. We call them the rules, or if you like, the principles of how ecosystems work. Ecosystems are regulated by changes in death and birth rates. And in our case, we see that, of course, as the death rate. And that results in an equilibrium, which is not always visible, but in fact, it is always there. Disturbance due to weather effects moves populations away from that equilibrium, but regulation brings them back again. Regulation can be caused by lack of food, and we call that bottom-up regulation and it can be caused by predators or disease, and this is top-down regulation. And both can occur in the same system. And in fact, in Serengeti, one supports the other. The bottom-up regulation of wildebeest produce uh, more predators, and those predators then turn around and can reduce the other prey species. So they are interactive. Migration allows large population. This results in bottom-up regulation and escapes top-down regulation. Long-term environmental change due to the climate causes all systems to change and they're never static. That's an important understanding. This means they have to track a changing equilibrium. If systems change too much, then they can jump to another state. So ecosystems can have several different equilibria. The take home message therefore from all of this is that these rules apply to all ecosystems. And where we have conservation problems with ecosystems, where we see uh, numerous problems around the world, we can see that they're always due, always due to an abuse of one of these rules. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. Great, great seminar, great story. It is, it is really amazing to be able to see, or it's like a movie, to see all these changes for so many years with all those old pictures. Uh, it, is, it is amazing. And there are many questions. There are many congratulations also from different parts of Mexico. There are people watching it from Puebla, Tlaxcala, Veracruz, Mexico City, Guanajuato. We also have some people from Chile from, uh, and from Colombia. At least those are the ones that are writing their names. So this is, this is great. And there is a number of questions uh, which I, I like to, to, to start with. One, you talk about uh, First, that ecosystems change continuously, uh, and uh, you show that they are changing di directionally from uh, climate change. And I guess with uh, with climate, with global warming now, they will continue to change. But um, uh, there is two questions. I guess the first one is um, you this equilibrium that you talk to. It's, a, it's not a state where you have the same composition and um, structure in the community. Uh, it's, a, it's a, an equilibrium where that is also changing. Is that correct? That's correct. It means that the equilibrium changes uh, as you get different populations, different species, different populations. Then you have a different, if you like, stable state. Um, as I said before, you very rarely see that in natural populations. We saw it in wildebeest, but that's extraordinary. I mean, I mean, people quote wildebeest simply because it is unusual, um, but it's always there. Uh, it has to be there, mathematically required to be there, uh, logically required to be there, but you never see it. Uh, and what I'm trying to stress is it doesn't always stay in the same place. It keeps moving around. It tracks the the environment, uh, climate change, I, I wanted to stress the fact that climate change is natural. 
it's not people i think are always hearing about what's happening now due to humans but it would have been changing anyway it, perhaps not as much and perhaps not even in the same direction uh, as what we've got now since the industrial revolution but nevertheless it is still changing and so we have to recognize that just if we're trying to get rid of uh, human effects of climate change it's not going to come and be stationary it's going to continue to change but probably in a different way and, and one related question to this ever-changing climate and ecosystems is that um, you are in Kenya and Tanzania, in the Serengeti, you're very close to the equator. Yeah. And uh, here in, in Mexico, I mean, I guess on the side of the Pacific, we have these oscill climate oscillations, El Nino and La Nina, yeah, yeah. and we have years of rain, years of, of drought, drought. And uh, do you have similar oscillations in, in, in the Serengeti? Yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, it's just, I couldn't talk about everything and I couldn't show you everything, but uh, I did mention disturbances and, and saying that climate, uh, uh, sorry, weather, uh, weather is just short term changes in climate, uh, you know, a few days, few months, a few years. Uh, so weather causes these changes. And we see, uh, for example, we've got records of wildebeest uh, survival of ca of calves over uh, over 50 years ago um, and they bounce all over the place so uh, spikes up and down and we find guess what they're almost entirely related to el nino there's a very strong signal of el nino in the survival of wildebeest calves uh -huh. but also topi calves but also the amount of food that lions eat, but also the amount of green grass there is in the system, but also the birth rate of El Nino. It's all determined by El Nino. Well, it's, it's, I guess it's all influenced by El Nino. And then there are uh, subtle mechanisms, as, as you say, with the top-down or bottom-up regulation. I, I notice in many of the pictures that you show, like the one particularly in the one of the elephants, that the grass is very short. So it, it's a very radical change in, uh, in vegetation, what happens there. And I imagine it's because of the migration or... Yeah, it, it really wildebeest is. are doing that. Okay. That's what wildebeest do. They reduce everything down to almost nothing. Uh -huh. And uh, another question is why is Kenya and Tanzania are so different. And you show the, the picture, you said, um, <laughs> how, I guess, why, how can the Kenyans control the poaching if that's one of the things they do? I don't see any fence on the other side of, uh, of the border. Okay. So uh, the answer is that, of course, it was politics. And in the 1970s, uh, there was a major confrontation between the two countries. Um, and as a consequence of that, the Tanzania economy collapsed, whereas the Kenya economy did not collapse. The Tanzanians couldn't protect their areas. They couldn't pay their rangers. Uh, there was no protection going on. And poachers then just had a free for all. It was carte blanche. And they killed just about everything. Uh, they killed all the rhinos. Uh, they got rid of 80% of the elephants. And the elephants, though, they're quite smart. They know where they're safe. And they, 20% marched over the border into Kenya. Um, so we effectively had very few elephants. And the few that we had left um, were extremely frightened. In fact, Stan Booten was with me at that period in 1986. And we got chased by some extremely frightened and extremely angry elephants. Uh, and only just... So that's really, it was a political situation that developed there. Uh, Kenya could protect and Tanzania could not protect. Now the situation is completely different. It's the other way around. The Kenyans are losing elephants and uh, the Serengeti are gaining elephants uh, because they're marching across the border again. They, they know the elephants are very um, astute. They know where they're safe. Uh -huh. We have a question here from Paula Correa. She's from 
the from Chile, and uh, she she made different comments. I guess she knows uh, your work. She says she admires your work with Australian mice and your proposal about regulation on predators. <laughs> and she is asking to one of her questions is that if predators can move the 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 equilibrium can can move the state of of the community. Can um, can okay. predators move the equilibrium too in populations? She asks. Uh, it, I, it's the question: Can predators shift the equilibrium level? Yes. Yeah, I think in principle yes, because the degree of predation determines um, is determined by the suite of species that uh, occur, prey species, but also other predator species. So if I was to take the example, um, and I hope the audience can remember enough about these different species, but if I was to take that example of Serengeti where we had the, the carnivores feeding on the ungulates, if we were to take away some of the species, let's say we took away the lions in the Serengeti, what would happen at that point is that some of the larger herbivores would now be escaping predation and they would then be switching from predator regulation to, her, uh, to, to food regulation, okay? And the switchover point from those two different types will go towards smaller species. If you get rid of, um, that was uh, talking about losing carnivores in the suite of species. And, but the same kind of argument will apply if you get rid of some of the herbivores. And that will shift where the equilibrium level is, determined by, of course, uh, predation. Predation always keeps the equilibrium level below the equilibrium level that is determined by food supply. It always has to be. That's a logical consequence. Uh, you can't have both predators, predators and food regulating at the same time. That's an, that's an impossibility. Um, they can both be operating at the same time, but only one of them is regulating. Um, and so that, that mix between where predator, predation occurs and where food uh, starvation occurs uh, can change with the species community. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, some more questions more related to conservation. Now that you have these rules and you could predict trends to the future, uh, and you could actually change management options. Uh, how do you go about that? I mean... Uh, 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 sorry, I missed that one. How do I... What's the question again? Like, uh, you, you can now predict some of the future trends if certain conditions apply because you know these rules. Yeah. And, uh, but what do we want for conservation? Uh, we want, uh, I mean, we could manipulate the system to get different outcomes. Uh, yes, absolutely you could. But do um, we want to do that? <laughs> I'm not sure whether you want to do it, but it's a, it most certainly can take place. The, the main way I like to think of it is we can think of each one of these rules and say, can we detect where this has gone wrong in, and where we've got problems? Um, for example, uh, if you distort the, 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 the fundamental principle of all of this is, is regulation. If you distort that, which can be taken, can occur if you cause a prey population to get too low, then they go into an inverse density dependent. That means that Instead of, as they go down, their survivorship doesn't go up. Their survivorship actually goes down instead. It's called the Ali effect. Uh, and is produced by a number of different factors. Um, but that's a distortion of the regulatory process if we do that 
as a result of human activity. And that's how we get species going into an extinction vortex, as they call it. Mm -hmm. So that's a distortion of that one. You can distort the idea of food um, regulation. For example, <clears throat> snow geese get fed extra food uh, down in Texas, I believe it is, uh, from agricultural land. Their populations are much higher as a consequence through human um, supplementation of their winter food supply. Consequently, they have large populations, they survive better, and they go up to the Arctic and they feed on the Arctic um, uh, uh, marine grasslands and completely devastate them. And that's taken place because of the distortion of the food regulatory system during winter in uh, southern USA. Uh, obviously, distort the predation, predation. rule. Uh, I could go on, but maybe I should stop here. But anyway, each one of these rules, I can point out how it can be distorted. And from that, you can understand how we can change it. Okay. Uh, Stan Putin also talked about uh, uh, the changes in the caribou and the wolf relations in Alberta and, and right. D.C. And um, he also made a point about, well, a couple of things. He made a point about um, these changes of states of equilibrium. And he made a point, as you are doing, of the static nature of protected areas. Uh, what can we do about that? I mean, that has been, protected areas have been there for uh, more than a hundred years and they are considered the greatest tool for conservation. What, uh, what uh, are the suggestions about protected areas? Okay, um, well, well, on a logical basis, you have to say, well, if your ecosystem that you're interested in conserving is going to move out, then you have to think ahead and protect areas that are currently outside of the protected area. Uh, you can do this a number of different ways. Uh, you can be doing it by expanding the boundaries of the park. You can do it by having corridors so that species can move, so to speak, to other protected areas. Um, but I am much more fond of the idea called rewilding, which is to make um, distorted ecosystems, uh, such as agricultural systems, human dominated, human distorted ecosystems, which are species poor. They lose most of the species. I mean, we've measured that in Serengeti, in agriculture versus Serengeti. We, we can lose 80% of insect species, plant species, and so on. Well, we can turn that around. And in, we don't have to take it away from agriculture. What we have to do is make it more user-friendly for biodiversity. And that's rewilding. And I think that's the way to go for this century. I think that's where the research should lie, uh, to make these things more favorable so that if our protected ecosystem can move into those areas, uh, it's not such a bad thing. So these are some ideas, um, and I think they need to be explored. And I don't think they have to be confrontational either with people. Uh -huh. Well, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, when you came to the conclusions that, the, that uh, the large mammals are controlled by their food supply, um, it, is, it is a bit uh, different from what we see in the movies. Now we see all the time these predators hunting and uh, <laughs> the lions, and we get the idea that, that they are doing the whole, the whole works. But as you have shown, uh, that happens only in the small, in the small ones, in the small herbivores. Now, do you have some? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure you have some observations about the small ones, where uh, they are. Most of them are eaten by predators. But what is the mechanism uh, of? Um, are there differential deaths due to territoriality behavior, as in other animals? Uh, sorry, the mechanism for what? Uh, I missed that. For, for, getting, for getting eaten, like uh, what is the selection of those animals that are eaten? Are those ones the juveniles? Are those ones the ones that, are, uh, that don't have uh, territory? 
Uh, yes, well, um, it depends on, on the species. The very small species have territories um, and they can defend their own food supply. So that's why they have territories. Larger species, it's not practical for them to have territories and they then form herds. But nevertheless, they can still be um, regulated by predators. Re predators can still catch enough of them to do that. Uh, they obviously take advantage of vulnerable individuals in the population. For territorial species, it's the males that are vulnerable because they're always spending their time fighting each other or chasing females. And they therefore are less observant um, and predators catch many more males than females. And we see that just about in all species. Uh, but the larger ones that don't have territories, then what we see is that species that are starving uh, or not starving, but species that say are sick or species that are young, um, they're all vulnerable. And so we see a much higher predation on, uh, on juveniles, for example, and obviously on diseased animals too. Okay, there are a couple of questions basically to be closing up. It's, uh, they come from Jose Luis Aguilar Rodriguez. He's from the Ministry of Environment. And he's uh, asking, well, first he congratulates you for the conference. Uh, this is great. And he is asking you about, um, about control, what, what to do with uh, exotic species on, on islands, how to control uh, exotic species on islands. Okay, well, just, just before I get into that, um, you can see that's a distortion of one of the rules. Um, I, of course, an exotic species can either be a herbivore or a predator. Uh, but if you put an exo exotic herbivore, it's going to, um, it's going to cause a top-down predation on the plant population, which was not there before. Uh, if you bring in carnivores, like, you know, there are carnivores uh, in New Zealand, lots of them, in Australia, lots of them. These are all exotic carnivores. That's a, that is a, a, um, an increase in, in the top trophic level, the carnivore level, which should not be there. It's, it's a distortion of the carnivore level of the top predators. And so again, that will cause uh, extinctions of, of prey, uh, which has taken place, of course, in Australia. Okay, well, so that, that's the rationale behind why you've got to get rid of these things. But if your question is, how do you do it? Well, that's a practical measure, and I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer how you get rid of individual species. Uh, there are all sorts of tricks to doing that. Um, uh, I've just seen a, a, a wonderful um, example of um, eradication that's taken place on an island called Lord Howe Island, which is off Australia, about 800 kilometers off Australia. And it had the great advantage that it was undiscovered by humans until the, the um, British convicts got there in 18 something or other, uh, or 1800 or something. Uh, they had rats and mice on the island, which of course were brought in by those people and those uh, rats and mice were eating up all of the seeds of the plants and so on. Uh, about three years ago now, they started a, a removal program of rodents using, using poison, uh, you know, aerially distributed poison. Uh, they apparently removed all of the rats and mice, which I think is something of a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're seeing extraordinary increase in very, very rare endemic species of plants insects and other things. So yes. there's a wonderful example of what's happening, pla taking place right now. Yes, th there is a number of examples here in Mexico too about uh, on the removal of exotic species on the islands, very successful. In fact, I think the Mexican researchers have been collaborating with people from New Zealand precisely yeah. on, this, on these topics. Well, Dr. Sinclair, it's been a pleasure Thank you very much for uh, participating in this series of seminars. It's really, really kind of you to have all this uh, opportunity for many people to hear about the great story of the Serengeti. We invite everyone to, to be together next week at the same time. We are going to have all the speakers.
They are going to close the series of seminars with the conclusions. We will have some time for conversation too. But uh, we want to thank you again, Dr. Sinclair, for spending this time with us. You are very kind. Carlos, it's been wonderful fun talking to you and talking to your audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Muchas gracias a todos. Nos vemos la siguiente semana con todos los eh, conferencistas para cerrar el ciclo con las conclusiones y una conversación. Muchas gracias.